Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion which you might be able to see behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today I've got a very very special plant review, one of my absolute favourite begonias which is the Begonia melanobulata and you can see some browning on the older leaves but we will touch on that later on. You know me, I like warts and all on this channel if at all possible. But yes, same thing as I always say for the people that have returned, welcome back. As always, chapters are down below so jump to the bit that you want to start watching first. For the new people, nice to have you here too. Just a bit of kind of caveating at the beginning of most of these videos, these opinions are massively biased to my experiences with my specific plant in my conditions which is growing in the conservatory which means generally good humidity levels, decent light levels as well in the UK and whatever that might mean in terms of grey weather and cold winters and wet winters as well but it will always be biased to my experience because that's the only thing I can talk of. However if you do have this plant as well what I'm hoping is that these review series videos will become a bit of a repository of information from other people that have had this because a lot of the times you can't find true real life actual human beings that have written something about the plant that you might be looking to buy in the future and you want to see is it worth it. So do if you have got this plant leave your own little review down at the bottom in the comments Think kind of Amazon review, it can be as long or as short as you want it to be but it will definitely be helpful for whoever comes across this video in the future. But yeah, enough about that, let's dive into the first topic. So with this plant and I'll kind of bring it up so you can see kind of roughly how it's growing, I will be putting this back down because it is exceptionally hot. The media on this is almost bone dry at the moment. I hadn't realized it was quite as dry as it is right now. So this is going to get watered as soon as I finished filming. But yeah, glorious sunny warm weather in the UK. You can never keep us happy because when it is gloriously warm and sunny, everything needs watering all the time. So I'm whinging that it's too warm and sunny and when it's cold and rainy and wet in the winter, I'm going to whinge that it's not enough light and it's too cold for the plants. Ah, you know, you can't please us, it's fine. <laughs> but uh, let me put this down because it's a bit of an awkward plant to keep holding up. I have got some clips that I'll be interspersing throughout the video but I'm just a bit worried about quite how wobbly this plant is. Do have a look at some of the browning that's happening on the leaves and I will touch on that in just a moment as well. Okay now that I've put the plant down and I'm a bit less nervous that it's going to snap in half let's talk a bit more about background and we'll talk about the way that it's growing further down in the video. But the background on this plant was and it's a bit of a story so strap in. I originally wanted to find the Begonia ferox and couldn't find it anywhere in the UK and this was a good few years back and I will obviously the title of the video will have an idea of how long I've had this plant for. I will also add a picture here from my plant care app to show you what this plant looked like when I first got it in my care and a bit of a spoiler this is the second Melanobulata that I have had in my care because the first one I did come across it when I was looking for the ferox and the story goes, I was looking at getting the ferox, it wasn't available at all. I couldn't find anybody in the UK three or four years ago back when I was looking at this now. I knew there were some people here and there that had it but I saw one picture on somebody's Instagram of a begonia that had like black spikes on the leaves and I'm just like that looks absolutely kind of hardcore and heavy metal and I was just like this plant looks awesome, it's got spikes. And anybody who's heard my interview with Jane Perone and the Solanum pyracanthum, which is another spiky, leafy house plant, you'll kind of know that I have a bit of a thing basically for this. So I tried to find the ferox, couldn't find it anywhere. I knew that it was not great at shipping. I knew that I could probably get it from the Far East. I knew that I could possibly get it from the Far East and get it shipped over here. But a lot of people that were doing it, they were just like, try to avoid the autumn and the winter, even in the spring, do it towards the end of the spring. So kind of 
warmish end of spring, beginning of summer is when you want to be getting this because it could turn to mush before it even gets to you. So I was just like, ah. So I was waiting around and waiting around. And then I came across the Begonia melanobulata, which looks pretty similar, almost identical. I think this one might be slightly fuzzier and the other one isn't. And I also am a sucker for begonias. You might be able to see behind me here. This is the Begonia seismorii and it's got some um, hairy leaves. I'll see if I can take a little video and put it over here so you can see what I mean with that one. I'm a sucker for hairy begonias, basically. Never thought I'd be saying that on the internet, but here we are. <laughs> but it's it's one of those things that I came across it and I'm just like, this looks really similar. And also something that I hadn't realized is the Begonia ferox, or ferox, probably butchering the name of that plant, is one that doesn't have the bullets, the bulletus, or the, essentially that's what those spikes are called, in uh, from kind of the more juvenile form. It's only when it starts maturing that it starts getting the spikes. But the melanobulata has those spikes from a very juvenile form. And hopefully that picture that I have from a plant care app would have had a slightly more juvenile leaf, I think. And I say I think because, as I mentioned, I had one before I had this one, only a few months before, and it was doing really well, and I was getting overconfident again. I'm just going, look, I am bossing this. I'm doing really well. I understand how people are finding this plant to be particularly tricky. I am finding it so easy. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I learned with that one. I had it on the heat mat, and this is one of the plants that was part of the tragedy was of me trying to learn what to use heat mats for and what not to use heat mats for. I've got another video on here about <laughs> my opinion on heat mats. You can go and have a look at that. But yeah, uh, lost that plant relatively quickly. Didn't know what it was. I thought it was because it was drying and it was getting wet too quickly. And I was just like, oh, I need to get it off. And I know begonias need to stay kind of constantly moist and all these things. I've learned a lot since then that if you've got your begonia in the right soil mix, especially if it's a light aroid soil mix, which is what I've got most of them in now, I find that if I water it shortly after it's gone fully dry, most of them really like it. And this one specifically needs it. So I've had more problems with this plant when I've watered too soon than anything else. And the leaves that you were seeing at the beginning of the video that were going slightly brown, yes, those leaves have also been on that plant for nearly two years now. But that kind of damage was happening when I was slightly overwatering it back then. All the new leaves are absolutely fine. This is a begonia that I find does need to go dry first before it's rewatered. But enough of a very, very long background section. Let's move into the next topic. So speed of growth with this one. Now, it's an interesting one because I find with some begonias they can be quite fast growing. And I'm thinking mainly of cane begonias. And you saw my eye go slightly to the side there. I'm looking at my begonia brevirimosa subspecies exotica. That is a cane begonia and it's pretty much a bit of a tree and I'm trying to see if it's snapped in half just because there's only so many support sticks that you can have to keep it up. But yeah, it's one of these plants that does take a while to grow. So I'm trying to think, I'm looking at it, it's on the floor in a kind of watering bucket and it's getting watered as we speak. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven leaves and one on the way. So twelve leaves. I've lost one or two leaves since I've had it, but that gives you an idea based on how long, and I'm pointing at the title hopefully of the video, um, how slow it can be. Granted the leaves are massively impressive, and also that is when I first started this plant it had juvenile leaves, it only had a couple of leaves if I'm not mistaken. So it took a while, it also took a beat while I was still learning on how to do the right watering with this plant. So not the fastest begonia, by any stretch of the imagination. It is a rhizomatous begonia rather than a cane begonia, so there's some something to think about there. But yeah, I mean, again, I'll do the usual benchmark. If a golden pothos will have two or three leaves each month in the summer, this one might have one leaf each month in the summer. 
and maybe one leaf every two or three months in the winter. It doesn't completely stop in the winter. It does really slow down. It does love a good bit of bright and direct light. I think give this as much light as you can give it without burning it and it will love you. This is pretty much almost in a south facing window. Granted it's got a net coat in front of it for all of the summer and it does fine, it doesn't bleach out. I mean the leaves are slightly lighter color but they don't actually burn so that tells you that it can take a bit more of this. I think this does grow in kind of areas that are high in line so that tells you something. I might correct myself up here if that isn't the case but I'm pretty sure I think when I was doing my research on this one it was. So that's something to bear in mind. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a relatively kind of not fast, not slow growing begonia. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. I've definitely had slower growing begonias than this. So moving on to ease of propagation. So ease of propagation with this one, as with most rhizomatous begonias, there are several ways that you can do it. You can either do a leaf cutting, you can do a stem cutting, you can do a petiole cutting. I found with this one a petiole cutting and a stem cutting are the ones that work the best and taking off about 60-70% of the leaf, especially if it's quite a large leaf because there's not going to have any roots yet. You don't want to overstress what essentially is a node without any roots on whilst it's trying to root out in order to bring this out. The way that I have found works best for this plant is dumps sphagnum moss in a um, prop box so the humidity is quite high with the LED lights on the top and it does take a while I find to root out but it does root out relatively well so there is that to consider about this one. I don't think it's any harder to propagate than any other rhizomatous begonia but it is one that does take a while to root out and get ready to start pushing out some new leaves but after that point it is at least it has been in my experience and do correct me if you've got this plant and you've had different experiences with this a relatively straightforward one to grow i've had other begonias that are meant to be easier and i have killed them in no time flat this one's been okay Availability on this one is an interesting one. As you've heard in the background section when I was talking here, the Ferox and the Melona bulata, at least in the UK, have become a bit more available. These are by, by no means plants that you're going to necessarily see, at least at the time of filming of this video. <laughs> Love my caveats, because if you're looking at this video in three years time and you're just going, it's everywhere, I'm just, oh, I didn't know then, I can't see the future. But for right now, it's not in most plant stores, it's not in any garden centers or any big box stores, so it's definitely not become a common begonia just yet. I think a lot of people would probably want to buy it. Maybe, actually, mm, might change our mind on that one. It might be one of those things that just because it excites Memo and it's got spikes doesn't mean it's going to excite everybody. But, <laughs> but you know, it might not be for everybody basically. It might be a, a take it or leave it kind of situation. I think it looks cool. You won't get a lot of plants that look like this. But yeah, it's, it's one that you can find a bit more readily available now. When I was first looking, as I said, there was only one or two sellers that I could find on eBay. And these were obviously private collectors that they've had it. It was mid towards high double digits. I don't think the price has dropped that much since then. It's maybe kind of slightly lower now. It's still probably going to be hovering around the mid to high double digits. I have seen slightly more established plants, I think recently, for triple digits. Very, very low triple digits, but triple digits nonetheless. I think the Ferox is always going to be slightly more expensive than the Melanobulata, which again, I don't know because I've never had the Ferox. If you do have both of them, is it because the ferox is slightly trickier to grow, propagate? What is it? Because I can't tell if these plants are very, very similar to one another, what the difference might be in the price. So moving on to pests with this one, and you'd be kind of happy to hear that I've not had an awful lot of pest pressures on this. The occasional spider mite, Nothing that ever got massively out of control. I wouldn't want it to get massively out of control because the leaves have got where the spikes are on the front of the leaf. 
you get kind of trenches in the back of the leaf. So the opposite. So essentially, it's a hollow spike. It's not a filled-in spike. So I would imagine if you get spider mites in there, that would be a pain to clean out. And if you couldn't clean it out, I would say sacrifice that leaf and wait for the next one because if they get a hold of and go over everywhere, I would dread to think. Um, and begonias generally aren't the best types of plants to be spraying down with any form of pesticide, whether it be organic, neem oil, or systemic. Their leaves tend to be on the slightly sensitive side. So, mm, yeah, I wouldn't want to be doing that necessarily with this plant, but I've not had that, as I said, too badly. The occasional mealybug, and again, because of the way that the petioles are, and they've got a bit of that pubescence, that fuzz essentially is what the pubescence is, and it's slightly hairy, it tends to deter a lot of pests from going there. Granted, the worst example of this is a varicosum because it still has some kind of pubescence on the petioles, but wow, is it a spider mite magnet. And to me, it was a mealybug magnet, more so than anything else. And I'm just like, how are they getting through this plot? It's made so it shouldn't be attracting them, really, in any way or form. It's a bit of a difficult situation to be in all the way, all those different hairs. That wasn't the case. So I don't know with this one, but I've not really had an awful lot of issues with pests. Touch wood. Accessories for this one. So it's an interesting one and you saw how the plant was growing in the pot. Yes, before anybody says this, I know I probably need to repot it. At the moment when you're seeing this, I am currently on the first proper holiday that I have had for over two and a half years. So these videos were all filmed just before I left uh, and they are hopefully going to be going out whilst I'm on holiday. But yeah, I'm going to be doing that when I get back because I definitely know that most begonias, and this one probably wouldn't be any different, they would like to get repotted. They don't generally like being repotted, I found. They throw a bit of a wobbly and this plant is one that will show you it's unhappy relatively quickly by dropping a leaf that took you a while to get there. So try to avoid that as much as possible. But I do know it needs to go into another pot. Just one size up will be fine. It doesn't need a much bigger pot because I find that the root system, when I do look at it, it doesn't grow that quickly. But yes, it does need an up pot and I'll hopefully find a way to maybe fasten that growing stem onto the soil so it doesn't flop around so much. And again, these videos can be quite tricky to film because me trying to get some of these plants out that are very precariously leaning against the shelf there's always a very high risk of when I'm trying to pull it out just to show you for a video, I might end up snapping that plant in half. But I do what I do because I love you all. So yeah, I thought I would uh, bring it out and show it to you because it was a bit easier to get it out this time around as well. So that is something to bear in mind with this one. Arrowed soil mix in terms of accessories would be a good one with this one. Plastic pot, I would say, over any other type of pot. I haven't grown this in pong. It's only ever been in my arrowed soil mix, but I would imagine it would be okay in pond. I might have to propagate a small section and see if I can get it to grow into pond. If you've grown this in pond, let us all know below. Generally with most begonias, I think the begonias that I've had good success with in pond are cane begonias, which I propagated in water and then moved into pond. They work beautifully. I don't actually know if I've ever propagated a rhizomatous begonia to then get into pond. I don't think I have actually. So mm, I'm getting an idea for not just a propagation, but maybe a propagation experiment video. But yeah, so that's anything. I mean, support sticks, it doesn't really need to do it. You can kind of see it's a bit more of a scrambler, so it's fine as long as you've not got too many things around it. And yeah, you can make it as complicated as you want to make it. I will fertilize this plant every second or third watering in the summer and maybe every fourth or fifth watering in the winter. But pretty much other than that, it kind of does its thing. It gets some decent light levels. I do let it dry out entirely. I have learned that the hard way. Obviously, I wouldn't recommend that this is a plant that you leave to be bone dry for days on end. It's still got begonia type roots, which are very, very thin. So they can desiccate quite quickly and potentially lead to root rot. So in that respect, it's probably not the easiest because you need to get that balance right. 
But to be fair, if you know your plant and you've got it to a point where you know that every three or four days, just check to see, and if it's summer, maybe check a bit more regularly and water it, you should be fine, basically. You, if you're checking it that frequently, it won't have gone for like two weeks with it being bone dry. So hopefully not an issue. But yeah, I think that's everything I want to say about accessories. And rounding off with final thoughts for this one. So I'll do the usual that I always do for these videos. If I didn't have this plant, knowing what I know now, would I purchase it? A hundred percent. Definitely a plant that I would always want to have in my collection. The fact that I had one that died and very quickly went and bought a second one to replace it should tell you something, even though I struggled with that plant. And again, I think this is probably more of a personal thing because I don't think I've ever seen any other plant that looks like it and I've been enamored with it and I've been trying to find the Ferox type of begonia that was very similar looking to this for such a long time. And when I get an idea stuck in my head, it ain't coming out of my head very easily. So I thought, yeah, definitely a plant that I always want to have in my collection. I still like it years later. So again, that probably tells you something. But um, giving it the score from zero being the worst and then 10 being the best, this would be a strong eight or a nine for me. Just purely, again, it might be a purely personal reason I like the look of this plant. I wouldn't give it a full 10 because it's not the most straightforward plant at times. But as long as you finally figure out what makes it tick in your environment, then you should be good. The one thing I will, and I've been meaning to say this the whole video, and I can't believe I've got to the final thoughts to say this, I will say I have always grown it in a condition where my humidity has never dropped below 60%. Even on my previous property, it, dro it did drop down to 60%. Sometimes in the summer during the day here it will drop, but it, at night it kind of bump, bounces back up to 80 or 90%. So, eh. but I. Just based on my experience, this doesn't need a terrarium. And you're, you're hearing me hesitate ever so slightly. I'd be really curious to see if somebody's grown this outside of a terrarium, if they would agree with me on this one. I've always had it in decent humidity. I've never had it in a fully, fully dry area, but maybe it might do okay as long as you stay on top of the watering. And this, this happens with most plants. If you stay on top of the watering, with a lot of plants and they're getting the moisture level that they leave from the soil sometimes you won't necessarily have to worry too much about the humidity it's not foolproof and it's not 100 percent of the times but generally speaking that does work that way but yeah hopefully i haven't prattled on for too long for this video hopefully you've enjoyed hopefully i shall see you here soon and i truly truly hope that you have a great rest of your day thanks bye